burden and responsibility. So most of you, because you are from the 2020, 2020 batch, right? So you must have completed your projects, isn't it? Or will be in the position of completing them. So how many of you had access to the ethics committee approval letter or an objection letter that was delivered to you? How many of you seen the ethics letter communication? Everybody? Or your PIs received it and you didn't get a copy of it or you didn't get to see it? Raise your hands. None of you got it? Okay. Some of you got it. What about the others? You have not seen how a communication is sent from the ethics committee about your projects? No? So who has not seen the ethics committee letter for the approval of their project? Kindly raise your hands. So some have not even raised for getting it and not even raised for... So you've not done any project that much. Who has not seen a project letter from the ethics committee? We have one or two hands which are raised. You had your project which was sent to the ethics committee? So you should ask your PIs to at least look at your projects. Why is it important to look at your ethics committee letters? When do you require it? I'm talking of in terms of your application. When do you require the copy of your ethics committee letter, which is for approval of your project which you're working on? To apply for research grant, good. Or and at the time of publication, yes. So if whenever you plan to write whatever you have done in your project, you will need a copy of your ethics approval letter to get your paper published. And therefore, it is also important to realize from the beginning of your research protocol, when you start planning your research protocol, that what are the ethical issues and that we have been talking about for the past two days. So what are we talking about about the ethics committee? What is our constitution and responsibility? So ethics committee are named as by different names in different institutions. In our institution, it is named as institutional ethics committee. You may find some publications in which it is being mentioned as IRP, that is an institutional review board. And you know how Centers like KEM Mumbai has two ethics committees. One is for the academic trials and one is for clinical trials and intervention studies. So when I go along, I'll tell you what is the difference between these ethics committee and the constitution, whether the ethics committee is looking at an academic trial or whether it is looking at an academic study or a clinical trial. So that is how it goes for us. In HEPVI, we have only one ethics committee, which looks at both academic trials and clinical uh, academic studies and clinical trials. Most of our workload is based on academic studies and some are clinical trials. And the second and the other thing which you need to remember that these are multidisciplinary committees that you have a la large number of people with different backgrounds. So the importance of ethics committee is highlighted by this that you have the government of India giving up guidelines how an ethics committee should be constituted, and this is for clinical trials. So it says that minimum seven members should be a part of the ethics committee, which should be from medical, non-medical, scientific, and non-scientific areas. In fact, the members from the non-scientific areas hold the most important role in the ethics committee. So the lay person, lay person is a non-scientific person who is someone from the community. One woman member, one legal expert, again, a non-scientific member, and one independent member from any other other fields. That is a social scientist, NGO, philosopher, ethicist, or a theologian. What is a theologian? Anybody? The rest of the words I think you know. Someone may not know what is a theologian. Good, very nice. So person who knows about different religions, what is it all about and the guidelines. So that is, these are all non-scientific members. So a lay person, a legal expert, and a person from any of these is a non-scientific member. 
So it also goes on to say that at least 50% of the members are not affiliated with the institute. So for example, an ethics committee which we have at SGPGI, we have 15 members and most of them are non-affiliated to our institute. That is, they do not belong to SGPGI. So the non-affiliated member is the chairperson, as was told by Dr. Nandini also today, and the affiliated member is a member secretary. And at least one non-scientific member is independent of the institution. Sometimes you may have a legal expert, expert in the board of the institute. Then that person will become affiliated to the institute. So you should have, have at least one person who is not affiliated, like a lay person or a social scientist or a legal expert. So for clinical trials, the EC members should follow the NDCT rules. This is from the NDCT rules that I'm quoting that was given by the government of India in 2019 and should follow the good clinical practice guidelines and other regulatory requirements. Uh, this is basically our Dr. Nandini brought out today, RSW, that is rights, safety, and well-being of the participants should be protected. And there should be a training in some way of the members of the ethics committee. So this, these are the requirements of the ethics committee. This is from the 2017 ICMR guidelines. And also, as I presented to you in the NDCT guidelines, so these are at least, so ethics committee members, therefore, should be at least seven, and they can be up to 15. So these are the different roles, a chairperson, a member secretary, a basic medical scientist, clinician, legal expert, a social scientist, and otherwise, and a layperson. So at least a member, this committee will have at least then seven members. But of course, we have more members for us as a medical institute, and this is for most of the medical institute, all colleges, not even, not just where human participation is being done, even where only studies related to drugs are being carried out. So for a center like HEPCI, we have more clinicians on the board, practically to look at different aspects of research in different streams of medicine. So this is just to give you an overview of the ethics committee that we have just now. So you can see that the name is so you have what is the role of the uh, person who is there, what is the name, and what is of course the address and the affiliation of that person. So this is how the ethics committee functions. So the role of each and every member in the ethics committee is defined. So for example, I said the chairperson has to be non-affiliated member, and the member secretary is an affiliated member. So that is what we need to remember when we formulate an ethics committee. So when you look, have you seen the ethics committee page on the website? All of you have seen. So whenever you have to submit your application online for a project, the link is present on the website of ACPGIMS. So when you go to research, you will find the ethics committee here. And this is about the ethics committee. You can download the forms. You can download the SOP, which are freely available for the of the institutional ethics committee. And this is where you have the online link for submitting the proposals for ethics. And this is a copy of our SOPs. This is, I'm not sure most of you will have submitted your projects online. If your PI did not submit and gave you the a password and the login ID basically to make you aware that how a project is submitted. So this is the online submission site for LGPGIMS. LGPGI is one of the few institutions in the country which has its own online software for these ethical ethics uh, projects. So most of the people are still doing it with hard copies. So functions, I, I already told you, it is about safeguarding the dignity, rights, safety, and well-being of all research participants. And the EC should be competent and independent in its functioning. And that is why you have affiliated and non-affiliated members. The research proposals that come to the ethics committee are the ones which are for initial review. So for example, you submit your proposal that is for an initial review, but we ask for continuous report of your project after one year, or if something happens and you want to do some amendment, then you submit it to the ethics committee. So that is known as a continuing review of those projects. And 
Sometimes you think that the ethics committee should only look at the ethical aspects of it, but the ethics committee is required to look at not only the ethical aspect, but also the science behind the project. Because as you would have understood in the last two days that we have been talking about a lot of things which are part of the science, which the ethics, where ethics and science to come together, move together. So that is why scientific and ethical review is done. So this is just to show the copy of the study assessment form. So what we do is when we have the projects which are submitted to us as an ethics committee, we allot it to different reviewers. We have one scientific reviewer, one reviewer who is generally a social scientist or a lay person who reviews the information concerned documents. And then we have a legal expert. If it is a clinical trial who looks at the clinical trial agreement, the insurance policy and other. So this is just a copy of the study assessment form which the reviewer is required to fill up when he or she looks at a research proposal which is submitted to the ethics committee. So if you look at this, you have scientific issues which come first. These are 1 to 11. I, mean, I have practically made this form so that it becomes easy for the reviewer to look at what aspects have to be seen. So we look at scientific issues. These include what are the objectives, what are the need for human participants, sufficient number of participants, control arms, and etc. Exclusion criteria, inclusion criteria. So trying to cover up all the scientific issues which may arise in a, in a study. And this is about the ethical and informed consent issues, which are again 12 to 30. So you look at what whatever these things have to be looked up by the reviewer when you submit a project. That is why when you get a, a, a letter from the ethics committee stating that this has not been submitted, this is not proper, because we are looking at each and every aspect of your research proposal, and if something is not submitted, you will get a letter for it to submit or make an amendment. Apart from the main committee, we also have SAE subcommittees and expedite review committees. So most of your projects, when you look at them, because they're academic studies, you will be getting them as expedite reviews. And if you look at your number of your letter that you receive, you will find that word EXP. So EXP means that it did not go to the full board of the ethics committee. It went to the expedite committee and that is the review committee, which is of only three members who looked at your project. And of course you have the SAE subcommittee. This is when you have a clinical trial and you have a serious adverse event. Generally, for you as students, you have generally some studies which are of academic interest, and generally, you do not have essays in your projects. So, let us look at the roles of different members of the ethics committee. So, this is the chairperson. So, basically, the chairperson is required to conduct the EC committees. He is a non affiliated member and he has to ensure independence. He has to ensure that the quorum is maintained. The quorum of the ethics committee is when you have five members of different streams which are there. It has to be a fair decision making. He or she is also required to handle all complaints and also looks as the conflict of interest which may be there within the members of the committee. The second person is a member secretary. Basically, the member secretary is required to organize all the meetings see the procedures have been done, the documentation is proper, schedule all meetings, make the minutes, see the quorum, and of course, have the training which is being organized and update the SOPs. Then we have the basic medical scientist. And as the name suggests, the person has to look at the scientific and ethical issues, whether the intervention can be done, what is the benefit risk analysis, the research design, methodology, statistics. Also has to look at the continuing review process, and for the clinical trials, it is important that the pharmacologist reviews the drug safety. So the basic medical scientist should have some experience of pharmacology. So for example, there is a study in which you, the researcher is trying to do something which the ethics committee does not have any expertise for. So it can be sent to an independent reviewer. And then you have the clinicians. We also look at the same aspects, but also look at something which is not looked by the basic medical scientist, that is whether there is provision for medical care, management, and compensation. The legal expert, of course, looks at, as I said, he or she also looks at the information uh, concerned documents, the memorandum of understandings, 
the clinical trial agreement, regulatory approvals, insurance, etc. Then you have the layperson. Well, who is a layperson? Can anybody tell me? We have been talking about laypersons. Dr. Nandini Kaurbhai also introduced it. Who is a layperson? In an ethics committee. Anybody? What do you mean by layperson? Non-medical, non yes, non-medical, <laughs> non-scientific person, non-scientific, someone who is a representative of the community. So like our ethics committee, we have journalists also. Those who are or an NGO, a member of the NGO, who are uh, participating with the community. So these are people, people who are lay persons who have to be part of the committee. And they are required to look at ICD. They try to look from the per, the participants' perspective whether this research proposal is justified or not. Then you have the social scientist, philosopher, ethicist, or theologian who looks at the ICD. Again, he looks at the participant and the community representative. He or she is required to see if this type of a study will have any recoverations or community involvement, the social cultural context or religious or philosophical context, which may have, which may cause disharmony among the members. So that is why the, uh, this uh, legal expert and the lay person and this uh, social scientist are very important part of the ethics committee to look at the non-scientific part of the study from the participants perspective. So once you have the ethics committee and the members know what they're trained to do in the ethics committee, the ethics committee is also required to communicate with the investigators at times with other ECs and also with the regulatory authorities. So that is how the ethics committee keeps on sending you the decision letters, the communication, etc. So once a project is given, these are the type of decisions which are given, whether it is approved, whether it requires any revision, a minor modification, whether it requires a major modification, and sometimes it may also be disapproved. So we have studies which have been disapproved in our in our institute because of various reasons. So, but these are few generally because we are doing academic studies. Most of them are approved or approved after minor modifications. The other important aspect, as I told, is continuing review. So the aim of the continuing review is to see for the progress, risk assessment adequacy of informed consent and local issues, where expedite review and full board projects have to go to the continuing review board. And it is the responsibility of the ethics committee to look again for the scientific, ethical, medical, and social issues. So the continuing review is generally once a year for the projects, but it may, it may at times be more frequent if there are more risks involved or if there is a vulnerable participant who is involved. So these are the terms which I just want to introduce you to. You may not be involved in any of these at this point of time, but those who are interested in research at any point of their life and they join an academic institution, these are the terms which you should be aware. So progress report is, of course, you give after one year. So what is protocol deviation? So you have made a protocol and you deviate. So you do something which is not a part of the procedures of the study protocol. That is known as protocol deviation. So I'll talk about how the ethics committee looks at them in the next slide. Protocol violation is something which is more severe than deviation. Deviation is something, suppose you plan to take blood samples and urine samples in all of your 50 participants, but you were not able to take urine samples in about 25 of those participants. So you were not able to take blood samples in about 20 of them or five of them. That is something which is a deviation from the protocol. But violation is when you deviate, which may affect the participants, right? So that is more severe. And uh, so that is what the ethics committee wants to look at. Sometimes you may not be compliant with what the rules of that country are. So that is what is known as non compliance. And that is a very severe offense. And of course, the SAE, as I told, these are the adverse events, which generally are part of the clinical trials. If you have any new information which is available, you have to tell the ethics committee. For example, you started with a drug trial and midway you realize that other people had also tried the drug and it is not effective. 
So it is your responsibility to tell the ethics committee that we want to, this is what is in literature and what do we need to do? Do we stop the study or we made mo modifications or you want to change the drug dose or anything? So that is the new information which keeps on coming when you're doing a study. So what does the ethics committee do about it? Of course, when you submit the progress report, as I said, you again look at the scientific, ethical, social issues and others and also see if there are any altered risk in the study. If it is a clinical trial, we look at the data safety monitoring board reports. If it is a protocol deviation or protocol violation, we try to give up the corrective actions. If it is non-compliant, we have to review the actions and report it. If the researcher remains non-compliant, of course, when it is a serious adverse events, what do you think? You know about what is compensation? It was talked about. So you have heard about compensation. Dr. Anita also talked about that about 64 lakhs were given to a patient. So when you have serious adverse events, the NDTT rules, that is a new drug and clinical trial rules, tell you how a compensation has to be given to the participant or the participant's family. So in continuing review, again, we have different type of decisions that we give that is noted, accepted, modifications, recommended or not recommended. Just a point about vulnerable population. So you know what is vulnerable? Anybody of you can talk about it? We talked about vulnerable population yesterday. Children? Yes. Terminally ill? Women? Subordinates are also vulnerable. If you are very senior and your subordinates become vulnerable, to be forced into taking a part in a study. So when you have a vulnerable part, and this vulnerability issue is all related. You should understand in a study, every time children will not be vulnerable. If you're doing a study only for children, for the benefit of children, they're not vulnerable. Of course, you have to have those safeguards. So uh, the word vulnerability is always a related term. And according to the project, it is used. So these are the generally the most common vulnerable groups and why they are vulnerable, women, children, terminally, and tribal people. So when we have research which involves vulnerable population, we, the, it is the responsibility of the committee to do a full committee review and it has to see that all safeguards are in place. So when the responsibility is with all stakeholders, the investigator, has to justify the inclusion or exclusion of a vulnerable population. He or she has to see the informed consent is taken properly. The con there are no conflict of interest. All safeguards and guidelines are being followed. The ethics committee looks at the expertise of the investigator that he can enroll a vulnerable population or not. Who's the, the primary reviewer has to have the capacity to look at the population. It has to be a full board review. The content at times may require a audio visual recording and ethical principles and SOPs have to be in place. When you have a clinical trial, it becomes the responsibility of the sponsor again to justify inclusion and exclusion of the vulnerable population, monitor it properly. They have to ensure quality assurance and quality control and then protect the vulnerable population. So these are the ethical guidelines which we have been talking for the past two days and showing you, uh, which are available freely on the LCMR website. And if you have any issues when you're submitting a protocol or later in your life when you submit a research protocol or a research project to different funding agencies, you can go through it and see what is required for you to do. So it is just what we have been teaching you is about being human, human being we all. What any questions for that is coming? So anybody of you was terrified on getting your letter when we opposed something, we said something, you remember something? You thought the ethics committee is troubling you? Must have. I see a not there. Yeah. We must be thinking we are just doing a simple study. Why do you send us send us back? Right? And most of it is because of the most of your project academic studies generally. Only objection generally is most of the time, 70% of the time is yes. good. It is CIE. So that is why your exercise is given to you. 
So that is the only thing which does not go through in the first, it is not passed or approved in the first go. The PID is the thing we keep on telling, but every time we tell when we have new students who come in, so that is how it goes. But I think it is important for you, not for these academic projects that you know how to make a PID, but for later on in your life when you do go research, uh, what is important for in an informed consent document. Okay. So how many of you are in a, uh, can submit us the ICDs? Now we go on to the last. Okay, so we will have an so-called a mock ethics committee. Doctor, can you call Doctor Preeti? I think you will be busy for five o'clock. So kindly submit your informed consent document. I have one question. Yeah, exactly. Who is there? Thank you for here. Please. Huh? Yeah. How do you, again, from the ethics committee point of view, uh, resolve the conflicts of interest? Suppose you have a funded project or something like that. Uh, what do you, from your point of view, repeat, repeat. repeat what you said clearly. How do you resolve a conflict of interest? For example, from a funded project, for a, in case of funded project, funded by some third party. Conflict. So, what all steps do you take from ethics committee side to see that the funding is appropriate or, or any? So when you see conflict of interest, the conflict of interest can be in many ways. What we are talking about that you have to clarify. So the conflict of interest can be that the investigator is not qualified to do it or another investigator is part, should be a part of the team who is practically doing it. The, uh, the investigator who is giving the drug is not in a capacity. So what do you mean by conflict of interest when you talk of a funded project? Whether the fund that is coming, suppose for a pharma, for a drug, drug trial, whether the pharma company has any ulterior motive behind, behind that particular study, so, how do you ch check that? So, in any case, when it is funded by a pharma company, a pharma company has its interest. That is a baseline when you start. So, you know that the pharma company has an interest. That is why it is sponsoring a project, right? So as per this, there is no conflict of interest. The conflict of interest comes when that drug is not, will not be useful for the participants who are being enrolled in that particular study, right? For example, you have a drug which is known to be useful in adults and you do not have evidence enough to use it in children. And now that pharma company without having any interest uh, information is now trying to enroll children in the project. So that now that it is a responsibility of the investigator to see that whether that drug will be useful for the children or not, whether it is to be done or not. If the investigator says that, yes, this can be done. Now it comes to the ethics committee. So what does the ethics committee do about it? The ethics committee will look at all the literature, which is there, which is evidence. And when you're talking of a clinical trial, this also goes first to the DCGI, right? So unless it has been approved by the DCGI, that is a body, all India body, which looks at these type of clinical or device trials, not only drug trials, but also device trials. So anything which is new, unless we have an approval from the DCGI, who are more competent in looking at whether this drug has been approved in that dose, in that population, then only we will, as a text committee, look at the project. So that is for the clinical, for the drug trials you are talking about. So if you say that is not basically a conflict of interest, it is just you are trying to have those thresholds in place. You're guiding principles in place before you approve a study. So unless it is approved by the DCGI, it will not go through the ethics committee. We will wait for the DCGI approval before we give it, give approval to the project. But that should not be counted as conflict of interest. Um, I have so a conflict of interest for a simple thing. Suppose I have a project in the ethics committee and I am a member of the ethics committee and I start telling about my project and what are the goods of this project. So this becomes a conflict of interest for me. So what we do in our ethics committee, if, we, if any of the members has a project, he or she is required to go out of the discussion room, of the conference room. He or she is not part of the discussion. And then we follow that rule very strictly. 
So these are the conflict of interest that the ethics committee has been 